Sí. Eso no es algo. Great. If uh, those who are joining us could take a seat, we will get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I see so many old friends in this room, um, old friends of Joe Tulchin, the former director of the Latin American program and of the Wilson Center. Um, I also see not only one former director, but a second former director, Lou Goodman, who's joining us from um, American University, um, and so many others uh, who have been meaningful to this program and in Joe's life. Um, we're here to celebrate the publication of Joe's most recent book, Latin America in International Politics, Challenging U.S. Hegemony. And just as a reference point, I recalled that I first, hearing, first heard of references to the concept of hegemony to mean something other than U.S. dominance in the hemisphere when, as an undergraduate, I read Abe Lowenthal, again, another former director of the Wilson Center, his uh, seminal article in Foreign Affairs in 1976, which was called The United States in Latin America Ending the Hegemonic Presumption, but with a question mark at the end. Um, that article, just to place it in time, opened with a description of the findings of the Chile, hola, perdón, uh, the Chile report of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that had documented U.S. policy towards Chile over the 10 years um, that culminated in the U.S.-backed coup against Salvador Allende. Lowenthal predicted back in 1976 that, quote, the days of unchallenged U.S. control of the Western Hemisphere are numbered, if not already passed, close quote. Um, the time, as you recall, was at the end of the Ford administration, a month before Jimmy Carter's presidency or his election and the articulation of a human rights policy that seemed to depart from or at least be at odds with the national security imperatives, either real or imagined, that had shaped U.S. policy in Latin America um, since the uh, advent of the Cold War. Um, since that time, the Berlin Wall has fallen, um, removing the east-west lens with which U.S. policymakers viewed the region um, to the consternation of Latin Americans and to U.S. scholars of Latin America alike, many of them represented here in this room. Um, the 1990s, as Joe's book illustrates, showed some level of foreign policy autonomy by countries of the region in the wake of the Cold War. But it was not really until the decade of the 2000s, certainly in my view, that this tendency flourished. It was fed on the one hand by a rejection of the U.S. In unilateral intervention in Iraq, and on the other hand, a commodities boom led by Chinese demand for Latin America's primary resources. China's rise and the import, importance of that for the growth of South America led to a new lexicon for international relations theory based on the concept of multiple options for global insertion. So now, um, Joe's new book explores these recent trends and the historian that he is, he puts them not just in the context of the post-Cold War years, but indeed the context of the last two centuries. Um, the result, in my view, is a bold tour de force that takes the, U the United States to task for the ways that it has and hasn't come to terms with the region's autonomy and aspirations for independence, but also asks of Latin American countries what type of leadership and what type of hard as well as soft power they wish to exercise in the world. Joe Tulchin needs no introduction in this house, but as I mentioned before, for those of you who may not know him, he is the former director of the Latin American program, serving in that capacity from 1989 through 2005. He previously taught as a professor of history and director of international programs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and also served for seven years as a member of the faculty of Yale University. We also have two commentators de lujo. Um, first, the Honorable Juan Gabriel Valdez is Chile's ambassador to the United States. He has served his country in numerous high-level capacities, including as foreign minister, as permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations, and as ambassador of Chile to Spain and to Argentina. Um, he also served, and I think this is critical for the, today's discussion, as the special representative of the UN Secretary General um, and chief of the United Nations mission in Haiti. He has consulted for um, 
every important international organization um, in the hemisphere and is also the author of uh, Pinochet's Economist, the Chicago School in Chile, among other publications. Um, the Honorable Luigi Ainaudi is also someone who I think no, needs no introduction um, in this room. He is currently a distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at National Defense University. But prior to that, he spent three decades um, as a diplomat for the Organization of American States, serving um, not only as um, acting uh, Attorney General, but also Assistant Attorney General of the OAS. And prior to that, he spent two decades at the Sta Department of State in a number of roles, um, having positions as the U.S. Special Envoy to the peace talks between Ecuador and Peru, a mem member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, um, and ambassador to the Organization of American States. Their full bios are outside. They will be on our website. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel today. And as a final comment, if you have your cell phone on and it is not on vibrate, could you kindly check? Thank you. Joe, the floor. Thank you very much, Cindy. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful to you and the Wilson Center for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, she mentioned that there are old friends in the room. Uh, at a certain age, um, some of us, that some of us have reached at least, when we speak of old friends, we refer not to their age, but to how long we've known them. And I just want that clarified. Um, there, at least I'll mention two, Sam Wells, a colleague here at the Wilson Center, of course. Uh, he and I were colleagues at Harvard, and I first met Ambassador Ainaudi when he was a teaching assistant at Harvard, attempting to explain to me, to us, there was a large group in the, in the room, the complexities of politics in Latin America and inter-American relations. And David Donelsky, who was my colleague at Yale, who reminded me, to my surprise, that it was 50 years ago that he and I met uh, at Yale, and we then went on to write a book together about Charles Evans Hughes, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and Secretary of State. Um, I want to be as brief as I possibly can about this book, because indeed we have two um, distinguished commentators. One already, uh, Ambassador Valdez, has begun to make corrections of errors he found in the text. <laughs> so we can look forward to that. The best I can offer is that the Spanish edition is, in char <laughs> is, is being published by uh, two Chilenos, Ricardo Lagos and Luis Mayra. So I will make sure that the Spanish edition corrects the errors that you bring to my attention. Um, and um, Luigi, I told Luigi when he asked what his role was this afternoon, I said I invited two distinguished people, both of whom are mentioned by name in the book and very favorably. And uh, the role that both um, uh, Ambassador and Audi, Ambassador Valdez, played in my narrative uh, is one of the points I want to make by introducing the book. The book is about two strands of narrative that I attempt to weave together. The first, as Cindy has mentioned, is my interest in the concept of agency, most commonly used in, um, among psychologists, and it means, it means the capacity in an individual to express identity and agency in action. It is not the same as autonomy, but overlaps with and has a lot to do with a sense of autonomy. In foreign policy, my understanding or how I use agency is a conscious decision by a sovereign state to act in the international community. It has nothing to do with the quantity of power or degree of leverage or influence that the country has. It does not comment upon the utility of or the rationality of and rat choice uh, language of the particular public policy. It merely focuses on an effort by a sovereign state to act in the international community. Um, one assumes that the urge to act is more often than not rational uh, and that the uh, effort the state makes to act is designed or intended to achieve goals like national interest. 
And there's a case in the book that I discuss at great length where I find a serious divergence between agency on the part of a government, in this case the Argentine government over several periods of time in the 70s and 80s, and the effort to maximize the country's national interests. And I comment upon that. Generally speaking, efforts of agency in Latin America are designed to accomplish national goals. And I'm interested in it essentially for two reasons. One is very personal. Uh, the first project I created when I came to the Latin American Center at the Wilson Center had to do with international affairs, which is an area of my expertise as, a, as an academic. And I had a number of friends in Latin America who shared my interest, and we secured funding for a project that discussed and, dis and did research about national security policy and foreign policy in Latin America. And my colleagues in Latin America, principally my co organizer, a uh, Ch Chilean academic, Augusto Varas, he and I and several others were astounded in the early going, 1990, 1991, at how little agency, we didn't use that word then, but how little independence of thought and action we found not only among our colleagues, academics, but also among decision makers in countries throughout the region. And that is, in essence, the provocation on our part of agency became one of the goals of the project, which lasted for over a decade. So I was concerned as I came to the Wilson Center and dealt more actively with public policy questions than I had as an academic, as to where, why is agency not more common? If you were an historian of the United States, you know that the country begins with a very clear and clearly articulated sense of its agency in the international community. It's part of the colonial experience. And interestingly, and one of, one of the facts that led me to sort of explore this more and to understand the evidence I came up with, it was very important to, what we, to who we call the founding fathers that the expression of agency be conducted through a legitimate political process. So you find in the very earliest gatherings of the colonies, the Continental Congress, for example, the creation of a Commission on Foreign Affairs that was designed and ordered to be dependent on the will of the people that they said are said to have represented. And indeed, the argument in discussing foreign affairs that the European countries, monarchies, authoritarian regimes, were illegitimate because the process did not recognize the will of the people. It was frivolous. There was impunity. There was no responsibility. And this concept of process will recur in the discussion of foreign policy after the Cold War in Latin America and become an absolutely critical part of what is the second strand of my narrative, which is the creation of or the evolution of an epistemological community of people who are interested in the foreign affairs of their countries in Latin America. The first great sign of this is the creation of Real, which is essentially a Chilean creation. Luciano Tomasini was the founding father of Real. And the earliest meetings of Real, which I was privileged to attend, characterize by a focus on policy process. Bear in mind, we're talking about the late 70s. Meeting in Chile to discuss political process has a little bit of a magical realist tone to it because we're in the middle of a military dictatorship as we were in Argentina, Uruguay, Ni hablar de Paraguay and, and, and other countries around. So the notion of political process is somewhat subversive when, as Latin Americans in meetings about Real, we began to talk about how individual countries should accomplish their foreign policy goals in a community where the process clearly was not fully democratic and therefore not fully legitimate. 
What happens from the late 70s through the 80s into the 90s is that young people, younger then than we are now, left, at least for a while, to go and get formal training, mainly in the United States, but not only in the United States, also in Europe, not only in international affairs and political science, but also in the case of Varas, for example, in sociology, but from all of the countries, people then in their 20s and 30s left and were formally trained, completed their graduate degrees in, uh, in temporary exile. Those people all returned. They returned to help shape the process by which foreign policy was formulated in places like Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and so on. When Brial was founded, there was not a single public network for, ex for exchange of ideas about foreign policy in Latin America. Today, there are at least half a dozen. The Brazilian discussion of foreign policy now has to compete for space on the internet. There are five periodic newsletters on foreign policy debate in Brazil. Nothing like that existed 30 years ago. So my interest is the gradual evolution of this group who begin by formal academic training, many in international affairs, and who then use that training to improve, enhance, 